Good evening everyone. Uh, welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study uh, as we come back into John chapter 13 this evening. Um, if you're joining us on Facebook then you're very welcome. Um, if there's anybody who wants to log in to Zoom for our prayer time later on it's the same details each week so it's the same ID and password so if you've ever got an email from us about it it's exactly the same so uh, don't think it's going to change it each time so you'd be all right um, but please come on ahead and join us then so we'll do this till about eight o'clock and then jump into our prayer time so if you see me again as usual going between the two it's just trying to keep an eye on the two screens in case anyone else is coming into zoom and i need to let them into it um, so as we gather as we start this evening let's just pause and let's pray together father again thank you for this day Thank you for all your goodness to us. Um, Lord, it's, it's been a week whenever we have really thought about and considered uh, what your son did for us at Calvary. Um, how he came, how he died, but how he rose again, victorious over sin, victorious over death, to give us the hope um, of eternal life through your grace. Lord, as we come now to look at your word, as we come to consider the words of your son as he approached that time just be with us tonight uh, and, and help us lord to understand this help us to be challenged by it help us to be encouraged by it just help us to draw closer to you we pray so lord we thank you and continue with us now we pray in christ's name amen so tonight we're going to go back into john chapter 13 so i'm going to read from verse 18 um through to verse 30 just at this stage uh, i'm reading from the new living translation uh, just as we as we do this so if it's slightly different from what you've got in front of you don't worry it's actually really good particularly for tonight because there's a little bit about language in it tonight so it's good if, you, if we have different translations so you can compare so this is john 13 starting at verse 18 i am not saying these things to all of you i know the ones i have chosen but this fulfills the scriptures that say, the one who eats my food has turned against me. And I tell you this beforehand so that when it happens, you will believe that I am the Messiah. I tell you the truth. Anyone who welcomes my messenger is welcoming me. And anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the father who sent me. Now Jesus was deeply troubled and he exclaimed, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at each other, wondering whom he could mean. The disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table. Simon Peter motioned to him to ask, who is he talking about? So that disciple leaned over to Jesus and asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus responded, it is one to whom I will give the bread I dip into the bowl. And when he dipped it and gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. When Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus told him, hurry and go and do what you're going to do. None of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant. Since Judas was the treasurer, some thought Jesus was telling him to go and pay for the food or to get some money for the poor. So Judas left at once, going out into the night. And we'll stop there. Um, I don't know if you were on with us last week or not, but we were talking about the first part of John 13, where it's Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Um, and how Jesus served them and showing them love and showing them service and getting them to, to model after that. Um, but there was something that Jesus said in that passage, uh, which is in verse 10. As he washed the disciples' feet, um, it said, The person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except the feet be clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. Jesus hinted at the fact that there was somebody in their midst somebody who was there who didn't believe, who wasn't a follower of Christ or a Christian, as we would say these days. And then in verse 18, Jesus comes back to it again. So I am not saying these things to all of you. You know the ones I have chosen. But this fulfills the scriptures that says, the one that eats, uh, who, who eats my food has turned against me. So in that, Jesus was doing a quote from psalm 41 verse 9 um, about how my my one who would be my friend shares my food 
And that's where Jesus takes that quote from. His, he's talking about Judas and what Judas was about to do. The fact that Judas was about to, to betray him. But it's interesting that Jesus says, I know the one that I have chosen. That starts to open up to us a massive topic. Um, not one that we can have through Facebook or through Zoom, because it's one that um, if we really want to discuss this, we need to do it in a small group, we need to do it in person. So we'll have to hold that one until we can actually all get together face to face, which would be lovely. Um, but it starts to lead towards um, what is to be elected or predestined and what does that actually mean um, if you want a reference for it then turn to romans 8 and even look at verses 28 to 30 and it's it's what does it mean to be chosen by god and by jesus does it mean that jesus literally picks us out and goes you 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 and you you're in you you and you you're out or is it about how jesus knows who will accept him who knows who will respond to his word. And it's those people that he puts his mark upon, who he predestines and who he chooses. So there's a whole big topic in there. And yes, I would love to get into discussing it. It would be great to be able to do that and, and really get stuck into it. But over Facebook or Zoom, it's impossible. Um, can you imagine us, if, if, if you weren't on, for those of you who are on Facebook, on this device here, as opposed to the one that's over that way, which is on Zoom, can you imagine everyone on Zoom trying to put their hand up and say, please, please, can I speak next? Can I speak? It'd be, it'd be impossible. So we'll save that one um, for whenever we're back. It'd be a really good one to do. But just think about it. And as you think about it, that if you listen to what I say, you'll, you'll get where I'm coming from. Why does John 3.16 say, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Uh, and it's, it's, it's how do we start and interpret, and how do we start to understand different things that Jesus says. But Jesus says in this book, not all of you are chosen. So he's very clearly singling out Judas Iscariot. But it's really interesting. Jesus still washed Judas's feet. Jesus didn't give up on Judas. Even though he knew that Judas would betray him. He didn't give up on him. He still washed his feet. He still reached out to him. And, 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 you know, and that's, that's such a challenge to us. Um, think of one person in your head who you really cannot stand. One person who just rubs you up the wrong way each and every time. But no matter what you say, if you say black, they say white. If you say left, they say right. Just that one person who no matter what just always does that to you. And then imagine you being put in a room with them forever and there's nobody else, it's just the two of you and you have to get on with them. Challenge, isn't it? Jesus, even though he knows Judas is about to send him as such to the cross, he's going to betray him to those who are coming to arrest him. He still washes his feet. He doesn't give up on him. And even though he's not chosen, he still reaches out to him. That's a hard one for us to follow, isn't it? It's a hard one for us to actually think, how, do, how would I keep on reaching out to that person? How would I keep on showing them love and consideration and patience and understanding? But Jesus does it. He's the model of Christ's behaviour. Just think about it, okay? Jesus says, the one who will eat my food has turned against me. So he's, he's told the disciples who it's going to be. The disciples are actually listening to Jesus. Whoever Jesus now shares with is the one who's going to betray him. And yet later on, you know, Peter's going over to John. He's going, hey, find out who it is, would you? But let's go on first of all before that. I tell you this beforehand. So when it happens, you will believe that I am the Messiah. So much of what Jesus tells his disciples, they don't get. Sorry, I'm shaking this table and the cameras are all shaking. They just don't get. Jesus says it and, and it's, it's as if it goes over the top of their heads. It's just, it's too much for them to take in or they just don't understand it. Um, but he says, it. I'm telling this beforehand so that when it happens, you will believe I am the Messiah. A great example of this is actually 
Simon and John, whenever they run to the empty tomb. John gets there first and he pauses. Simon gets there and rushes in. They see the, the, um, the fold the grave clothes. They see that the tomb is empty. And it says that at that point, John, or as, the, as, he, as he writes about himself, the disciple who loved Jesus, John understands and believes. It took that point, it took that to happen for John to realise, hang on a minute, Jesus told us this was going to happen. He told us he was going to die and rise again, but we didn't, I didn't get that. I didn't believe it, but now I can actually see it with my own eyes. Now I believe it. So Jesus tells him, he explains it to him, I'm telling you this now. So when it happens, you can believe that I am the Messiah. Now in the New Living Bible, I don't know about your Bible, but in the New Living one I have, the words I am are in bold print because the words that are I am mirror what Jesus said back at the time of the first Passover, at the time whenever Moses in the wilderness, whenever he says, who will I say sent me? I am who I am. And it's that same phrasing, that same wording about who God is that is used here as Jesus talks about, I am the Messiah. And then Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who welcomes my message is welcoming me. Anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. There's that recognition that God and Jesus are the same. You know, starting to, it, it, it's all about the Trinity. Um, so Father, Son and Holy Spirit. God is three people, one but three. Um, interesting fact, where do you find the word Trinity in the Bible? You don't. It ain't there. It's a phrase that we use as people. We use the word Trinity because it helps us to understand God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Um, so that's a, a man-made, if you want, phrase, but it's the recognition or the understanding that God is one and God is three, and what does that mean? And it's our way of starting to head around it, and Jesus is alluding to that here. He's talking about, if you welcome the messenger who I have sent, you welcome me because they're doing my will, and if you're welcoming me, you're welcoming the Father. Because remember Jesus said earlier on in John's Gospel, if you've seen, if you, and we will do, sorry, in, in 14, those who have seen me have seen the Father. And it, 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 it's that recognition of who Jesus is um, and, and, and who God is. But this is the, the interesting verse then. So Jesus knows everything. Jesus is God. Jesus knows why he's come to earth. He knows that he's about to go to the cross. He knows that Judas is going to betray him. He's already said, the one who eats my food will betray me. And yet, in verse 21, it says, in the New Living, it says, now Jesus was deeply troubled. Um, other versions or translations say Jesus was troubled in his soul. Um, the word that's actually used in that verse means stirred up or disturbed or troubled in the Greek. Um, and it means emotionally and spiritually. Why would Jesus be stirred up? Why would Jesus be disturbed or troubled? Why would it say that he exclaimed? Because Jesus, even though he's divine, is a person. He's a man, he's a human being, and he's gonna feel the betrayal. He's gonna feel the loneliness, and he's gonna feel pain, immense pain. You think it's sore whenever you get a, a scalp in your finger? Jesus is about to have nails driven through his hands and feet. He's about to have the skin ripped off his back with a whip, probably with its tips, with bone or metal. And he's going to have big crowns pushed into his head. He's going to be so beaten that it'd be hard to recognise him. And then he's going to have his side pierced about to suffer immensely and yes his human side is going to feel that and feel that pain and you know what it's like if you know something's about to happen we all we all know what emotional trauma is like what what stress is like especially you know, you can identify with that through lockdown and jesus is troubled with that so whenever we are feeling troubled 
we have the assurance of knowing that Jesus knows how we feel. He knows that pain. He knows that suffering. He knows that anguish. And he can identify with us. And he can put his arms around us and say, I know how you're feeling. Just have, give it to me. You know, and it's, it, it's, it's wonderful to realise that our Saviour feels that with us. That we are not alone. We're not the first person to feel this way. And we're not going to be the last person to feel this way. But Jesus feels it too. And then it says that Jesus exclaims, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. So he says it again. And then that's the point whenever the says the disciples looked at each other wondering whom he could mean. The disciple Jesus loved, John, who wrote this, was sitting next to Jesus at the table and Simon Peter motioned to him, ask who it is. So he leans over and he asks Jesus. And Jesus responds, it is the one to whom I give the bread I dip in the bowl. And that's the second time he's told them who it will be. And then it says that Jesus dips the bread in the bowl gives it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. And when Judas has eaten the bread, it says Satan entered into him. So Satan is tempting him. Satan is in his ear, going like this here. And he, he's, he's tormenting him. And he's prompting him. And, you know, it's like, oh, think of the silver you're going to get. Think of the money you're going to get for this. And for Judas, that was a big thing. Um, we told elsewhere in the New Te in John's Gospel again that Judas was their treasurer. He held the purse strings, and the reason he did that was because he wanted to help himself and he wanted to steal. So Judas wasn't following Jesus because he believed that Jesus was somebody special or the Messiah. He followed around with Jesus because he saw personal gain. You know, he put his own needs before that of what else was going on. And we can all identify with that, can't we? We all know of people who just want out of it what they can get for themselves. I mean, this huge industry, um, which we call the prosperity gospel, um, where people appeal for money and give to me and, and my cause and you'll be blessed by God. And you'll, for every £10 you give to me, you'll get £20 back. I, and you know, and, and they con people into giving money all the time. And it's not appealing because of what they, because they want to use it for, for God's work. They're appealing because they want to line their own pockets. And that's what Judas was out to do. He was out to line his own pockets. And so Satan tempts him and he betrays Jesus for a purse full of silver. And then Jesus says, and hurry and do what you're going to do. There's nearly like an air of disdain in that. You know, go ahead and go, go and do what you're going to do. You know, I know what you're going to do. They, your, your friends sitting around here, people who, who think they're your friends, they, they don't know what you're up to. I do. Go on and get on with it. And it says that Judas went off. It says, so he left at once, going out into the night. And it's really appropriate that he's going out into the night because the night is darkness. And darkness so often in the Bible represents sin and evil as opposed to light, which is Jesus representing good and salvation. So again, to say that Judas goes out into the night, it's very metaphorical. It's very, paints a very strong picture that Judas is going out to do something which is wrong, something which is evil, and that he is being encouraged to do so by something which is evil as well. And it's only after that then again, once he leaves, that Jesus goes into a large period of speaking to his disciples, giving them the last bits of wisdom before he will be crucified. So Jesus says in verse 31, let me read this little bit of the last bit of John 13 to you. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory and God will be glorified because of him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will give his own glory to the Son and he will do so at once. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you cannot come where I am going. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other, 
just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, you cannot go with me now, but you will follow me later. Why can't I come now, Lord? He asked, I'm ready to die for you. Jesus answered, die for me? I tell you the truth, Peter. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. Jesus tells them that his time has come. He tells them it very clearly. And at this point now, Jesus talks very clearly to the disciples, not using parables as such, but trying to use clear speech so that they will understand. My time has come to go. You know, we all have that time. We have that time that we know our time on earth is up. But we know that whenever we go, if we follow Christ, we're going somewhere special. We're going to be in heaven with him. And now Jesus is saying his time has come to go and, and God will be glorified because of it. So this will point people to God. And because of that, then God will give glory to Jesus. And again, it's the link between God and Son and Son and God. And just shows how the two of them are, are completely joined and yet appear separate. And he just says, dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. I am sure Jesus' heart is breaking for his disciples because he knows the anguish that they're about to go through. He knows they're going to watch him die on that cross. And that's going to be so difficult. But he says, look, you can't come with me. I know you've followed me for the last two years, but you cannot come with me. Not yet. And that's for two reasons. One is he doesn't want them to suffer the way he's about to suffer. He doesn't want them to be arrested along with him and for them to be crucified. But the other reason is because they still have something to do. When Jesus dies and then rises again, he will have done what he, was, what he came to earth to do. He will have fulfilled his role and then he can go and he can rest at the right hand of God. For us on earth, we have a role to play. We have what God's will is for us. And when that will, when we've done that, then God takes us to be with him so that we too can be in his presence to know that rest and refreshment uh, and that healing uh, and to know and to see that glory. You know, Peter seems to be really eager to die he seems to be eager to rush in he says he, he will die for jesus but jesus gives him a reality check and says you're going to deny me peter i know that you say it now but you're going to deny me and again it's just that recognition that at times we do go our own ways and we do things that we later regret things that we we get annoyed about and we get upset about and we wish we hadn't done but god still loves us and he still holds us as his children. You know, when Jesus appears again to Simon, he says to him three times, do you love me? Then feed my, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And Peter feels annoyed and cross because Jesus asked him three times, but he denied Christ three times. And Jesus just wants to let him know that I'll keep going with you, Peter. Even if you fall again, I'll keep going with you so that you can do what I've called you to do. Which is verse 34. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Don't give up. Don't turn your back on each other. Don't lose heart. But keep on going. That's the one big challenge I take away from this passage. How do we love those who don't love us? How do we keep going with those who, no matter what they do, just, just seem to do everything to wind us up the wrong way? Those who just, yeah, just rub against us. And yet we're to love them. We're to love them the way Christ loved them. The way Christ loves them right now. So there's our big challenge. Who's it going to be? Think about that. And how can I love them? 
Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for your word tonight. Thank you again for the encouragement that we are not alone, that your son can identify exactly with, with us and because of that, then you identify exactly with us and you know and feel the pain that we feel at times as well as knowing the joy that we feel. Lord, help us to be like Christ and to show love to those who don't show love to us. Help us to persevere with them just like Jesus persevered with Judas so that your love can change and transform lives. Father, we thank you, now and always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks, folks, for watching along. And I trust that the rest of this week that you would know God's peace and God's blessing. So thank you for watching. And I'm going to switch off Facebook now and we're going to transfer onto Zoom for our prayer time. So if you're on Facebook, take care and God bless.